from Canberra. Treasurer, good to have you with us. You've, good you've, had, you've had to deliver so much bad news this year. <laughs> to deliver some news with a smile is a, is a welcome break, I'm sure. But you would know that people who've lost their livelihoods, they're unemployed, you've seen the, le the lease uh, signs in, in shop windows, they don't feel as if the recession is over, do they? Well, technically, the recession is over, but the recovery is not, Stan. Uh, these were encouraging uh, numbers that we saw today, uh, a 3.3 per cent increase <coughs> in uh, GDP growth in the September quarter was the largest increase in quarterly growth since 1976. Uh, this was the economic recovery that Australians have worked so hard for and made great sacrifices for. Uh, but as the Governor of the Reserve Bank said today, mm. uh, the road ahead will be lumpy uh, and bumpy. It will be hard. It will be long. There will be some sectors like aviation and tourism with the international borders being closed that will do it tough for some, some time yet. But yeah. generally the numbers are better than expected. And that road ahead will lead to March, and in March, job keeper, job, job keeper and job seeker come off, and that's going to make things even more difficult, isn't it? I mean, you, part of what's held the numbers up here is consumption and people going out and spending. What mm. happens when we hit that point? Well, you're right that consumption has driven the numbers today. A 7.9 per cent increase in the quarter for consumption after a fall of 12.5 per cent last quarter. And this is a reflection of the easing of restrictions. People are starting to go out, spend money on transport, hotels, cafes, restaurants and recreation that they couldn't do uh, early in the crisis. JobKeeper has been a remarkable success program. It's helped uh, sustain 3.6 million workers in the month of September. But in the the month of October, the latest ADO, ATO data shows, Stan, that mm. um, two million fewer Australians are on yeah. JobKeeper. And so the, the economic recovery is underway. But I don't want your viewers to see JobKeeper as the only economic support program that no, we the, have no, across no, the economy. No, there's not. Indeed, indeed, the Reserve Bank has intervened to also keep interest rates low. And all of this goes to the stimulus measures mm. that have helped to get us to the other side here. But mm. all of that has to change eventually. How long can we maintain this this stimulus cycle? Well, the JobKeeper program has been consistent with our principles that we set out early in this pandemic, namely that those measures would be temporary, um, they would be targeted, they'd be scalable, they'd be proportionate to the challenge we face and that they use the existing systems. So it was always the intention that that program would end. We extended it for another six months and it has been the glue between employers and employees. But as you know, in the budget, which I delivered on October mm. the 6th, there were tax cuts for more than 11.5 million Australians. There were business investment incentives. Uh, there's the job maker hiring credit, all of which have been legislated through the parliament. We've brought forward infrastructure spending. We've invested mm. heavily in apprentices. Um, that's going to help support what... the economy next year and the year after. I want to ask you about China. How long can this spat continue and how much damage is this going to do to our economy as it, if it deepens? Well, China's our number one trading partner. It's worth more than $200 billion a year and actually good its exports to China effectively doubled uh, since we came to government. And, and, and right now they're hitting our expert, exports and right now our relations are at a record low. How much damage is this doing? Well, it is damaging and it's... Uh, you know, very uh, challenging as well uh, to have these trade tensions with China given um, the importance uh, that that market is for Australian exporters. But let me say it's a mutually beneficial relationship as well. Our iron ore has underpinned China's economic growth. Our agricultural yeah, produce, it, 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 produce it, it is, is among the best in the world. Now we would like to resolve some of these issues with China bilaterally. We have said publicly um, that we would like to sit down and have a mutually the problem, beneficial and respectful dialogue. We can't have that dialogue. You can't pick up the phone now and call your equivalent in Beijing. You've wanted to get this relationship back on an even keel. Have we made mistakes? How much have we contributed to this? The Australian government contributed to this. Look, Australia's position hasn't changed. When it comes to those 14 grievances that China uh, outlined, they included our free press. 
they included the right of democratically elected parliamentarians to speak their mind. They, they talked about our foreign investment framework. In all those issues, um, they go to the heart of our identity, in some cases to our national security. But, but what you're, and you wouldn't what expect you're, us to trade that away. No, no, but what you're outlining there is something that's intractable then. If we keep making demands of each other, both China and Australia, that neither side can meet, how do you break this, this, uh, this cycle right now? What's, what's the circuit breaker? Well, again, uh, we have said uh, very publicly that we're um, very uh, pleased to, to sit down uh, and have a mutually beneficial dialogue. If we can't do that bilaterally uh, and these trade tensions can't be resolved that way, we reserve our right and our options to use multilateral forum mm. and that's what uh, the Trade Minister has ad alluded to as well. Yeah, with the World Trade Organisation and others. Can, can I just turn to this, this announcement about Pfizer and rolling mm. out the vaccine in the UK? As, as early as next week, what does that mean for Australia? Have we had conversations with Pfizer about bringing it here, fast-tracking the release here? Well, our Health Minister, um, Greg Hunt, who's worked so hard uh, throughout this crisis, he has had a conversation tonight uh, with the CEO of Pfizer here in Australia. And we welcome um, that, uh, that uh, development in the United Kingdom. Of course, the UK's position stand is somewhat different to Australia. They've had more than a million infections, more than 50,000 deaths as a result of COVID. Uh, right now in Australia today, uh, there is no one in an ICU unit or on a ventilator as a result of COVID. Now, we have our vaccines going through our own approval processes and that will take mm. its normal course. So we're not likely to see this in the near future. It's not something we can bank on early in the new year, for instance. Well, again, um, Greg Hunt has talked about that, that he hopes to see uh, that approvals process concluded uh, around the end of January. But again, uh, we've got to ensure uh, the community safety uh, with respect to, to, to these vaccines and with respect to, to those trials. Only got about 30 seconds, but what would it mean economically if we were to get a circuit breaker like a, a viable vaccine? Well, actually, we had some scenarios in the budget, Stan. We actually had one scenario that if a vaccine uh, was rolled out across the country six months earlier uh, than expected, and the expectation was by the end of next year, then that would be worth $34 billion uh, to mm. the Australian economy. So there's definitely an economic yeah. uplift uh, in the event uh, that we find a vaccine. But I have to say, Australia has done remarkably well on both the health and the economic front, and you wouldn't want to be in any other country but Australia right at this time. Treasurer, good of you to join us. Thank you. My pleasure.